Yes. Okay, and it's the full screen. Okay, great. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with the trainees today and um, the other PIs that um, have joined. The talk I'm gonna give um, is gonna focus on locust nutrition. Uh, the title of my talk is Locust Nutrition and Integrative Perspective, trying to stay true to the uh, goals of the BPRI. And what I'm gonna talk about today, um, it's the first time I, I think I told this to Hojin and to Greg, it's the first time I've ever given a talk that is um, focused pretty much exclusively on locusts. Um, so kind of a fun talk. It's uh, a mixture of uh, sort of data that I've collected over my um, time as a, as a graduate student, postdoc, and a professor. Um, and again, the heavy emphasis is on locust or Schistocerca grasshoppers. And I think I've thrown in one Melanopolis species just to, to talk about it as a, as a approach for sort of thinking about nutrition. So um, the next slide, um, what you can see here is sort of a, a mixture of animals. And the fundamental thing that I want to emphasize here is that nutrition is fundamental for all organisms. The top figure um, are some gazelles. Um, they're herbivores, much like um, the locusts that we all study, um, and they feed on on plants and they get their nutrients from plants. Um, to the right, we've got a killer whale catching a, a penguin that's jumping off of, a, of an iceberg. Um, predators also have um, key aspects of nutrition that they have to follow. Um, but beyond that, we've got um, a mixture of other sorts of organisms, um, insects, honeybees that collect pollen, nutrients in pollen. Um, the middle figure are Drosophila flies. Um, we have people at BCM that work on Drosophila. Nutrition is critical to them, and they've been an incredible model organism for understanding the multidimensional aspects of nutrition. Um, ladybird beetles, I've done work on ladybird beetles um, as well, um, specifically with respect to some micronutrients. Um, and even plants and things like slime molds, nutrition is important for them. Um, we've got a Venus flytrap with a, with a grasshopper in it. Um, and then slime molds, um, some really beautiful work done by Audrey de Satur, who many of you know, um, that's looked at the um, ability of slime molds, which have no um, central nervous system. They still are able to make um, nutritional decisions. Um, if we look at nature, though, one of the things that we um, never see are organisms in the wild um, that suffer from chronic problems that we see um, in humans um, or our pets. I know many of us probably have pets that we love to treat with great care, um, and sometimes we overfeed them. Um, and I think partly what this reflects is that animals um, in their normal contexts um, are, are capable of making um, very informed and good decisions when it comes to nutrition. Uh, and interestingly, locusts were actually one of the model organisms that sort of is foundational for this field um, of, of nutritional foraging behavior. So when we think about um, nutrition, um, and in my lab in particular, um, a fundamental question you have to ask is what nutrients are important? Um, there's a total of 30 different nutrients, um, give or take a few, that are critical for all living organisms. Um, for animals in particular, there's a suite of 20 amino acids um, that are critical for um, growth, development, um, survival, reproduction. Um, those are macronutrients that contribute to protein production. Um, other key macronutrients important for insects and other animals include carbohydrates, um, specifically um, digestible carbohydrates that can provide energy, um, and fats. And these are the three big classes of macronutrients. These are nutrients that are needed in sort of large amounts, but they're also um, available in foods typically in large amounts. Um, in contrast to macronutrients, there's a big suite of micronutrients that are important for um, animals. Um, and the issue for micronutrients is that they're not needed in large quantities, um, but they um, can often be critical. And for insects in particular, one that I've been working on since I was a graduate student is cholesterol. And what's really interesting about cholesterol, I think we're all familiar with cholesterol, and we know that we have to sort of keep an eye on it for our own health. But for insects, it's really important because, and arthropods broadly, because they lack the um, ability to make their own cholesterol. What that means is that they have to get cholesterol sources um, from their food. 
In addition to cholesterol, there's other micronutrients, um, in particular vitamins. There's water-soluble and fat-soluble vitamins that are important. These are often cofactors for enzymatic processes. Um, there are elements that are important, particularly metals, um, zinc, iron. Um, zinc is critical for, for grasshoppers in particular, um, and you find high concentrations of it in mandibles, um, which are critical for, for processing food. Um, the plants that they feed on um, contain compounds that can wear those mandibles down, um, and zinc is a, is a strengthening agent for mandibles. So Again, everything from macronutrients to micronutrients um, are important. And then the critical aspect um, is to get these things um, in the right ratios and amounts for a specific animal. Um, and, and this is sort of a big message to the trainees in general. Um, I, I sort of emphasize this a lot when I talk to my classes and to my students. When you read the literature, there's a lot of discussion of food quality. Um, but it's often poorly defined. And so a fundamental question that's critical to ask is what does it mean when somebody talks about food quality? Historically, um, until about 30 years ago, there was an emphasis on nutrient maximization um, and specifically um, key nutrients, um, either protein or nitrogen for shorthand or energy. Um, and it was assumed that the more you could get, the better. Um, and so food quality was sort of um, a, a, a unidimensional axis, but we now know that, that food quality is actually multidimensional. Um, and sort of thinking about what that means and understanding um, that for insects is, and, and other animals is really important. Um, how does my lab sort of approach nutrition? Um, uh, historically, I've, I've worked on plant feeding insects, and I got my start working on, on grasshoppers, both as a master's student and a PhD student. But as a PhD student, I started to, to play with caterpillars. And then since, and then I worked on both caterpillars and locusts during my postdoc in Oxford. And then coming to, um, to Texas a and I began to expand um, even more, given the um, colleagues that I had in the department. It gave me an opportunity to branch out. So what are some of the, the animals and insects that I've worked on? Um, up in the left, you can see um, a desert locust. That's actually a photo that I took um, outside of the uh, building at Oxford um, my last year that I was there. Um, I've also worked on caterpillars, uh, aphids. Many of you know that I'm doing nutritional work on ants and in particular fire ants. Um, we've actually recently patented and are in the process of developing an ant bait um, that may be useful uh, in the control of invasive ants in particular. I've done some work on Drosophila at various levels, both with macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, and then one of the other uh, big projects that I worked on, um, and Rochelle was involved with some of this work, was looking at uh, nutritional physiology in crickets. And as you can see, um, this is a cricket called Gryllus firmus. Um, and like locusts, it practices phenotypic plasticity. The one on the top is a short wing morph. The one on the bottom is a long wing morph. Um, and in the case of these um, two morphs, there's a trade-off, a physiological trade-off. The short wing morphs um, do not invest in wings or flight muscles associated with wings. That means that those resources that they would otherwise go to those tissues can go to ovaries. And so they have um, enhanced reproductive output. In contrast, the long wing morph that you see on the bottom um, has uh, functional flights, wings, and muscles. Um, and the trade-off is that when they eclose, um, their ovaries are small. And so there's a trade-off in terms of reproduction. The advantage that these long wing morphs have is that they can disperse if the environment or the conditions in their current environment are unfavorable. Um, how else do we study nutrition in my lab? Um, we take um, a range of different approaches. As many of you know, and those of you that have seen um, Chris Brennan do his work, um, we focus a lot of our work on artificial diets. This is um, a photo that I took while I was on sabbatical in Germany a few years ago. Um, it's a Schistocerca gregaria eating an artificial diet. The nice um, aspect of working with locusts and grasshoppers is that they readily eat these artificial diets and they grow really well on them. And the beauty of working with artificial diets is that you can precisely control the amounts and ratios of the nutrients that you're interested in investigating. Um, historically, we've put a big focus on protein and carbohydrate um, amounts, but I've also manipulated sterile types and concentrations in these diets. Um, with these diets, you can ask any question 
um, for any nutrient that you think might be worthy of investigation. Another approach is to actually use plants. Again, this is another photo from experiments that I did while I was on sabbatical in um, Germany. Um, and what we have here are three cups. You can see there's a purple um, tape, red tape, and green tape. Um, the purple tape is um, a plant called Shawia purpurea. The green tape is one um, Pyoscamus muticus. Um, uh, and then the mix is a treatment that has both those plants. And this was work again done with desert locusts to look at the effect of diet mixing. And I'll talk a little bit about the details of this um, at the end of the talk. Um, finally, we can go out to the field. Um, and this is a critical aspect of the work that Ariane and Rick are doing. Um, and um, it's important. And one of the goals of the BPRI is to link lab studies to field work. And so um, this is some work that was done by a PhD student of mine um, a number of years ago, Paul Lenhart, who actually did a watering experiment to um, examine the effects of um, moisture. Um, this was a drought year. And so we looked at the effects of um, water supplementation versus um, no water supplementation. And we looked at the nutritional profiles um, of the plants on his plots. And at the same time, he was looking at grasshopper communities um, and trying to understand um, how habitat selection was influenced in this particular case by the, the, the presence of water supplementation. Okay, so we can go in the lab to the field, we can use artificial diets, we can use plants, we can actually do um, field experiments as well. So many of you are familiar with this idea of a geometric framework. It's critical to the research that we're doing. It's uh, critical to the work that Chris Brennan is doing. Um, and this is a, an approach that was created um, by Steve Simpson and David Robbenheimer working on Locusta migratoria in the early 90s. Um, and it's, it's revolutionary in the sense that it um, recognized that nutrition is multidimensional and uh, recognized that insects and all animals are simultaneously regulating uh, multiple nutrients um, at the same time. So again, it's not just that they're looking for one thing um, at the expense of everything else. Um, they have various mechanisms that allow them to um, sort of assess and respond appropriately to the nutritional content of foods. So how does this geometric framework work? I don't think that I've ever um, had a full walkthrough of this. So um, this is an opportunity to um, sort of present this geometric framework. Um, to all the trainees, um, given its sort of its, its sort of centrality to much of the work that we're doing. So again, the geometric framework focuses on the idea that uh, insects regulate and and utilize multiple nutrients simultaneously. Um, it's challenging to represent uh, nutritional regulation on multiple axes, but um, an easy way to do this is to um, focus on two axes. So what we have here are protein and carbohydrates. Um, protein is on the x-axis, carbohydrate is on the y-axis, and the basic idea here is that um, there's a specific amount of protein that's optimal for any particular animal. There's also a specific amount of carbohydrate that's optimal for any animal. Where these two points intersect is referred to as an intake target, and this is the blend of nutrients that's optimal um, for that particular animal. Um, how else does it work? Um, Within this approach, one of the really nice aspects is you can also represent the foods that are presented to animals uh, in this geometric framework. So here we have a, a food that has an equal amount of protein and carbohydrates. And if you start from that um, origin um, of both of those axes and draw a tangent from that origin through the point where those intersect, that represents the protein carbohydrate ratio of that food. And for this particular animal, because it intersects the intake target, it's viewed as a balanced food for this particular animal. Other foods can be represented. Um, and so here we have a food that has three times as much protein as carbohydrate. Um, I call this an Atkins food. It's a South Beach food. It's a high protein food, right? Um, alternatively, we can have a food that has three times as much carbohydrate as protein. This is a high carb food. And you can see then that we've got three different rails here. One that's a high carb, one that's balanced, and one that's an Atkins food, um, high protein. 
Um, if an animal has access to these three foods, um, ideally what it should do is feed on the balanced food. That's the one that matches its intake target. Um, and, and those three foods that are available um, define the sort of nutrient space that this animal lives in. So we've got the high protein food and the high carb food. Those are the extreme um, ends of this nutrient space. And then we have the balanced food in the middle. So what happens if this balanced food isn't available? How do they reach the intake target? Well, they can eat some of the high protein food. They can move over to the high carb food, switch back to the high protein food, and then switch back to the high carb food. So by switching between these foods and eating in the right amounts, they can hit this intake target. Um, the geometric framework also um, can be used to, to assess nutritional regulatory rules that an animal uses when it doesn't have um, the ability to switch between foods. And so the panel on the left represents that situation where there's a choice. You can see in this particular case, it's had two meals on the high protein, on the high carb food and three meals on the high protein food and it ends up at the intake target. But the figure on the right shows um, the choices that the um, animal has when it's on a food that does not intersect the intake target. So. As you can see, um, the red dot indicates that intake target. The first choice that the animal can make is to eat to the blue point on that rail. Um, and if it eats to that point, it meets its requirement for carbohydrates, but the blue line um, that connects to the red dot indicates its deficiency in terms of the amount of protein um, that it's lacking to, to meet its intake target. Alternatively, um, it can feed along that rail that that sort of brown rail until it hits the orange point if it hits that orange point um, it's satisfied its protein requirements but at the expense of greatly overeating carbohydrates so there's two issues here um, if it stops at the blue line it under eats protein if it feeds to the orange dot um, it greatly overeats carbohydrates so um, what's a third possibility a third possibility is that it can feed to that white dot and that white dot represents a compromise a nutritional compromise where it says i'm going to eat to some intermediate point between that blue and orange line um, in doing so i'll still suffer um, a protein deficit but it won't be as severe um, and alternatively i'm going to overeat carbohydrates but again it won't be as severe so there's a compromise made um, and, and so this geometric framework approach allows you to identify intake targets and it allows you to identify rules of compromise. And if you have a number of these um, foods available in the no choice scenario, and we and I presented this at the last time that we met for the plenary session um, and work that Chris has done, you can create intake arrays and these intake arrays um, provide insights to the, to the global rules that, a, that an animal uses when making these nutritional compromises. Okay, um, how does the experimental system and protocol work? And again, I think the, the really cool thing about this geometric framework, um, A, it started with locusts. Locusts were the model organism, um, and this is locusta migratoria. This is the very first um, locust that was used where the geometric framework was applied. Um, but as many of you know, since this work in the early 90s, it's been expanded beyond insects. Um, to include um, fish and pets, um, rats, mice, um, and even humans. Um, and so the approach is applicable across all sorts of animal systems. So how does this protocol work? Um, again, in, in the sort of early days, um, it was built around using synthetic diets. Um, again, what's nice about these diets is that we can regulate the protein and carbohydrate amounts. Um, here are these foods um, in this approach. So again, we've got um, what we call here a high carbohydrate food. It's, it says P7C35. That means it's got 7% protein content and 35% carbohydrate content. Here's an equal ratio food. Um, it's got 21% protein and 21% carbohydrate. And then here we've got a high protein food, which has 35% protein and 7% carbohydrate. All three of these foods, if you sum those numbers together, provide a total macronutrient content of 42%. Um, that's where it's called isocaloric. And so we can um, control both the total macronutrient amount and the ratios. And this provides um, a great amount of power in terms of assessing um, questions related to nutrient regulation and nutrient utilization. 
with this approach, because we've got these artificial foods, um, we can actually calculate the amounts of food that's consumed. And we can calculate these intake points because we know the protein and, con and carbohydrate concentrations of these foods. Um, and additionally, we can measure performance and examine utilization. And this allows us to understand um, how insects, um, locusts, or any other animal um, are, are using the foods that they're ingesting and converting them into body mass or converting them into fat supplies or converting them into protein. Um, so it's a really powerful approach. Um, this artificial diet approach, um, I think of this or deem this as a bottom up approach. Um, and it can show us how an animal responds to various challenges. Um, part of the reason I've included this figure, um, this is sort of historical. This is the arenas that I used when I was a postdoc in Oxford. Um, and so you can see that it was a large circular um, container. Um, there's metal perches, there's a water dish in the middle. Um, and then this particular experiment, there are three different um, food dishes in that experiment with a water container in the middle, um, which allows them to drink. Um, with these experimental approaches, um, work by uh, David Ramahammer and Steve Simpson in 93 showed that Locusta um, is incredibly good at responding to nutrient dilutions and concentrations. So when they're given an optimal food that has different total macronutrient amounts in it, if the macronutrient content is low, they eat a lot more of the food. If the macronutrient content is high, they eat much less of it. So they're not eating for volume, they're eating for nutritional amounts. Um, later, um, there was some work done by uh, Paul Chambers, who was a graduate student in um, the Simpson lab. And uh, this was the first experiment where paired nutritionally suboptimal but complementary foods were put together. So this was a choice um, process. And Paul showed elegantly that um, given choices between nutritionally complementary foods, um, the locusts were incredibly good at regulating to um, similar intake targets, regardless of the nature of those complementary foods. When I came to do my postdoc at Oxford, um, I expanded some of this, um, these approaches and asked different kinds of questions that were based in sort of more um, sort of ecological foundations. Uh, and so one of the um, experiments I did was to change the frequency of different foods in the arenas um, and ask, how does this influence nutrient regulation strategies? So the little cartoon in the left you can see um, it's that circular arena. There were four dishes of food. In this first instance, there was a protein high food and three high carbohydrate foods. And those foods are shown as the sort of brown seafood and the blue pea food. So there were three brown seafoods and one pea food. And that red dash line is the intake target. So if we start with one protein dish and three carbohydrate dishes, that's the expectation if they were feeding randomly, but this is actually where they ended up. If we then change those um, frequency of dishes to provide two protein dishes and two carbohydrate dishes, that's where we would expect to see if they're feeding randomly, but that's where they end up, right on top of that same point where they had three carbohydrate dishes and one protein dish. And then we can do the, uh, the complete extreme opposite. We've got three protein foods and one carbohydrate food. That's where they would be. That's where they end up. Um, and collectively, the intake target for those three points um, was not statistically different. So it shows regardless of the frequency of the foods in these environments, um, there's tight nutrient regulation when they have a choice. The follow-up experiment to this was to ask the question, does the distance between um, food dishes matter? Um, right? So do they have, they have to work harder in theory, if um, the foods are spread out. So we had in this particular experiment, three different arenas, one that was small, 20 centimeters um, in diameter, uh, 40 centimeters in diameter, or 80 centimeters in diameter. So small, medium, and large. And in this particular experiment, there was one protein dish and three carbohydrate dishes. Um, and what does this experiment show? That's where they would expect to be if they were feeding randomly. What did we show? that the intake targets, regardless of the arena size, all overlapped and were not statistically different, and they aligned with that intake target. Um, furthermore, we looked at the nutritional composition or the lipid composition, which sort of implies that um, maybe lipid level um, is higher uh, or, or, or is going to be, there's going to be cost to lipids um, in terms of accumulation if they have to move greater distances. Um, and we actually showed that, that there was, um, uh, uh, higher lipid levels um, across the, the larger arenas. Um, and so there is some sort of um, 
correlation between distance um, and lipid composition. There's the nutritional side of food, but um, as many of you know, um, when we look at plants, plants also contain um, plant secondary compounds. Some of these compounds are used to um, protect the plant from herbivores. That's what the hypothesis is in the literature, long standing time. Um, so we looked at, uh, I didn't look at this, this is work that, that Steve and David did. Um, they looked at interactions between um, nutrients and uh, with tannic acid, which is a secondary compound which is toxic for locusta migratory. Um, what did they show in these experiments? Um, if you look at these, this panel that I have here, um, the top panel is the food that is carbohydrate rich. So it's P7, C35. The middle food is that balanced food, which is optimal. And the bottom food is the high protein food. Um, and what you can see here is if you look at that optimal food, on the x axis or on the on the x axis of those panels um, is the concentration of tannic acid in the diet. So zero, three point three percent, six point seven, or ten percent. Ten percent is really high. Um, but what you can see is that if they're on the optimal diet, um, and that's just survival that's being shown, even a concentration of tannic acid as high as ten percent. Um, locusts are relatively immune to the effects of tannic acid as long as they're on a diet that aligns with their optimal intake. Um, as we move to foods that are rich in PC, notice um, survival on the higher concentrations of tannic acid begins to drop off significantly. So we're beginning to see that there's an interaction between the nutritional content of the food and um, the presence of tannic acid. And on the really suboptimal, imbalanced, um, high carbohydrate food, notice that any tannic acid is detrimental. Um, and basically what happens here is that the effective dose of tannic acid um, decreases as the diet becomes more um, uh, carbohydrate biased. Um, and interestingly, tannic acid, the mode of action is one that it acts as a feeding deterrent. If we go in the other direction um, and we increase the protein concentration, on that high protein diet, you can see that there's still this negative impact of tannic acid, but it's not quite as extreme as it was on the high carbohydrate diets. Um, but again, the effective dose um, effective dose of tannic acid decreases as the diet becomes protein rich. But what's interesting here is that the mode of action of tannic acid changes. Tannic acid is now a post ingestive toxin. I follow these experiments up some more choice experiments. The, the work that I just showed was all no choice experiments. Um, and so here we've got three dishes in the arena. Um, one of the dishes is a high carbohydrate food plus tannic acid. Um, another dish is high protein food plus tannic acid. And then in this experiment, I presented a third dish that was one that varied in its nutritional composition, but it had no tannic acid. And we asked, what, what does the insect do in terms of nutrient regulation? So the first um, experiment where the tannic acid free dish, um, we gave it one that was, um, carbohydrate biased. So 7% um, protein, 35% pr carbohydrates. Um, what did we see in terms of um, diet mixing strategies? Um, they ended up where we've been seeing them end up. Um, they were willing to, um, th they can reach this part by eating some of the, by eating the food that doesn't have tannic acid in it. But to get to that intake target, they've still got to eat protein that has tannic acid. They're willing to do that. What if we um, increase the protein content a little bit. Again, they, they focus um, on eating the, the tannic acid free food, but are willing to eat tannic acid um, when it's in a protein food. Um, and then here, um, again, we see this diet regulation. So they're, they're actively regulating their intake, even though they're also having to ingest tannic acid. If we give them a food that um, is slightly protein biased, um, what you can see is that they um, will um, focus on that food and they, in this particular case, they don't eat much of the, of the um, carbohydrate containing food. And remember that that food um, has a feeding deterrent when the tannic acid is present. And then when we give it the high protein food um, with no tannic acid, we can see that they um, will eat some of the carbohydrate food with tannic acid um, as a way to sort of approximate. But um, what this data basically shows is that tannic acid and high carbohydrate foods um, is, is, a uh, is avoided by locusts. Um, so the, the presence of, um, the importance of protein for, for these locusts is really high and they're actually willing to eat tannic acid to get that protein, um, to, to, um, 
to regulate their nutrient intake target. Okay, so we've talked a lot about Locusta. Um, here I want to shift um, to Schistocerca now, and Schistocerca is the genus that um, we're all working on. Um, this was one of the very first um, papers that did a comparative study between um, solitary and gregarious locust um, in this nutritional context. If you look at these um, two panels, what you can see is that the white bars represent the solitary locust, the hatch bars represent the gregarious locust. Um, and on the left, we have stadium duration, and on the right, we have survivorship. And if we look at stadium duration, we can see that um, typically across these diets, um, the stadium duration for the um, gregarious individuals um, was longer relative to um, the solitaries, except for on these extreme diets. Um, what's also interesting, when we look at the effects of diet on survivorship, we can see that um, solitary insects um, are pretty robust against shifts in um, diet composition in terms of survival. Gregarious insects are much more sensitive to it, particularly when there's um, low protein concentrations. Um, I talked about the ability to um, use nutrition and locusts to understand regulatory rules with respect to how they respond to imbalances in their food. Um, and these are some of the sort of um, simple rules that Steve and David um, have um, sort of identified. Um, and there's six of them in particular. The one on the left, panel A, um, basically shows that, that insects eat based on volume. They just eat for a specific amount. Um, panels B and C say that the rules that regulate feeding, um, if the x-axis is protein for panel B, um, you eat until you um, consume a fixed amount of protein and then you stop. In the case of C, um, the rule is you eat amount of carbohydrate until you stop. Um, in the case of panel um, D, um, the rule is you eat until you reach the threshold for one of two nutrients, either protein or carbohydrate. So there's two um, nutrients that are uh, influencing the choice. Um, in the panel C, um, here you stop when you hit a threshold response um, for either nutrient A, which is um, protein, or nutrient B, carbohydrates. Interestingly, um, we have not seen this rule in any organism until um, two years ago. Um, some work done by a graduate student in entomology on honeybees um, and nurse bees has revealed um, this rule, which is really exciting in terms of um, what's regulating feeding strategies in honeybees. And then the last rule, um, panel F, indicates um, that there's some compromise. And this is what I talked about early on in these, in these no choices. So there's some compromise that's made between um, overeating nutrients in excess and undereating nutrients that are in deficit. How does this apply to Schistocerca? Um, I showed this uh, uh, at the plenary talk. Um, the panel on the left is just is the solitary. The panel on the right is gregarious. Um, and if you look at those um, arrays, what you can see is that um, on the left, it, it's sort of it's curved and sort of fan shaped. Um, for the uh, gregarious on the right, notice that instead of sort of being fan shaped, um, especially on the extreme diets, the, the arrays bend outwards. And so they have very different characteristic shapes. Um, the solitary locusts are referred to as error minimizers. And so they're trying to sort of minimize um, errors associated with under eating or overeating. In contrast, the gregarious individuals um, are said to be nutrient maximizers. And the idea here is that if you're a gregarious insect, um, with a bunch of other gregarious insects, you can't be choosy and fussy about what you eat. When you encounter a food, um, you should maximize um, the intake because you don't know what the composition of your next meal is going to be. Um, however, um, and this is work that Chris is working on, we know that gregarious individuals um, occur with other gregarious individuals. And so all these experiments that have done um, in the past um, treated solid treated gregarious individuals um, and, and isolated them from other conspecifics and so they were done in isolation. So Chris has um, sort of taken this to the next level and has asked questions about what happens when the feeding patterns of these gregarious individuals when they are in the presence of conspecifics. 
Um, and specifically what he's done is he's, um, he set up a experiments where he's had three insects together, but they can't um, directly interact with each other. They have their own separate food dishes. And then he's had um, another arena where they can directly interact and they have to share food dishes. Um, and what we see here, um, if you look at the bottom two panels, is that those intake arrays are more similar to the solitary individuals than they are to the gregarious individuals. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that it appears that gregarious insects um, don't consume as much food when they are um, together um, as opposed to when they are in um, isolation. And that's interesting as well. So I want to shift here to some work that I've done with Americana. That's another, um, it's just a circus species that we work with. And what we have here um, are experiments that look at the effects of um, nutrient balance versus total macronutrients. Um, so that's uh, just a circa Americana on the left. And what we see on the right are sort of the range of foods that I've used in these experiments. And I've overlapped them with um, the, the, that gray area, the sort of light brown area. Um, there are plant species that are indicated in there, um, which just shows the nutritional space of some of the host plants that, um, that Americana might um, encounter in the field. So here's the basic experiment, and I've got a number of figures, and they're going to, um, it, it's the same data, but it's parsed into different treatments to sort of emphasize different points. So the key question I'm asking in this experiment um, is one of nutrient balance versus total nutrients. Um, if you look at the x axis, um, the treatments are listed. Um, in the middle of that figure, the total macronutrient content for the five middle bars is 42%, and those range from high carbohydrate foods to balanced foods to high protein foods. On the far left, you can see a diet that says 7-7 that has um, very low total macronutrient content. And on the far right, we've got a treatment that has 35% um, protein and 35% carbohydrate. So super high density um, food for these locusts. And so the question is, if more is better than we would expect um, that 35-35 to really um, be the best diet, um, given that it's also um, an equal ratio diet, which we know um, is best for Americana. Um, and what we actually see here is that um, the 21-21 diet is not any better than the 35-35 diet. Um, and so that sort of tells us that total macronutrient content isn't necessarily the best thing for these. There's, there's consequences of, of being on high density foods um, and, and utilization of these nutrients um, uh, is not always 100%. So uh, more is better, but a lot more isn't necessarily better. We've also shown that nutrient balance is critical, more so than just total nitrogen or total protein content. So if protein content was the most important thing, the diet on the right, 35-7, would be the best diet. Um, but that's not what we see. Again, the intake target, the self-selected intake target for Americana is um, is, is a one-to-one -one ratio, and the diets that do best are the one-to-one -one diet, um, and then also the 1428 diet, which isn't too far away, okay? So um, nutrient balance matters. Um, here's a treatment, uh, a comparison of two treatments that have the exact same protein content, and what do we see? We see that um, the 35-35 diet is way superior to the 35-7 diet, and what that tells us is that without carbohydrates, which is the energy to drive the process of growth, um, you can have all the protein in the world, but it's not going to do you any good. Um, in contrast here, we've got diets um, that have the same amount of protein. Um, it's at the lower end, but we can see again that more carbohydrates um, is beneficial if we're looking at dry masking. Um, and then finally, here we've got diets that have um, the same amount of carbohydrate, but very different amounts of protein. And what we see, there's no difference, even though there's a diet here that's got five times as much protein. So again, it, it emphasizes how carbons can limit growth um, as well as protein. A critical part of sort of thinking about nutrition is, is to sort of relate this directly to the field. Um, this is Paul Lenhardt. He did some work uh, in Texas where he characterized the protein carbohydrate landscape um, of a prairie system. Um, and I just, I'm showing this just to sort of um, represent what, a, what the nutritional space looks like in the field for a community of grasshoppers from Texas. That dashed line represents a one-to-one -one, um, protein to carbohydrate ratio. These were analysis that Paul did of um, grasses and forbs in 
The green dots represent grasses, the yellow dots represent forbs, broadleaf plants. Um, and what you can see, um, if you look at this data, is that grasses tend to have much less nitrogen and more carbohydrate than forbs. Forbs tend to be rich in protein um, and less carbohydrates relative to grasses. And this is important for an insect that's a mixer. Um, locusta, which only feeds on grass, um, its nutritional space would just be related to those green dots. But something like Schistocerca gregaria or Schistocerca americana um, can feed on both grasses and forbs. And so the nutrient space for something like gregaria um, or any of the Schistocerca species, which are generalist feeders, um, is going to be much broader. Um, this is some work um, that he looked at the, the nutritional composition of, of the um, plants seasonally as well. Um, and what you can see here is that the nutritional composition of plants is dynamic. Um, season matters. Um, in June, um, that's when uh, sort of early part of the summer, um, and you can see that the, in particular, the forbs have a higher nitrogen content. Um, but as we shift into July, and again, remember that this was um, uh, a, a drought-based year as well, you can see that the nitrogen content of those plants shift. And so that's telling you that the resource um, distribution changes seasonally, uh, and that's going to have impacts um, on our on our um, on our grasshoppers and locusts. Um, you can also sort of take plants from the field and ask questions about them with respect to nutrition. This is Marianne Legall, who worked with me as a PhD student, and she had later did a postdoc with um, with Ariane uh, at ASU. She's now a lecturer um, at Arizona State University, and she worked with a um, species called Melanopus differentialis. She worked at two different sites, and she collected the plants at these sites and asked some questions about nutrient regulation for the species, which is a mixer. Um, and on the left, we have um, plants from uh, a, a site called Travis County. Um, she collected the dominant grass and the dominant forb at these sites. Um, the green um, dashed line indicates the protein carbohydrate ratio of the grasses at that site. The yellow represents the protein carbohydrate ratio of the forbs at that site. And what we can see when we put the insects on, um, what do they do in terms of, of composition? You can see that they're more tightly regulating their protein intake than their carbohydrate intake. So they're willing to overeat carbs um, to sort of more closely match their, their um, protein content. If we give them a choice between these plants, um, this is where the, the red line would be if they're feeding random. But what we can see is that they're um, preferring to have a, a carbohydrate biased um, intake. She then looked at a second population same sort of um, situation, a grass and a forb. You can see at this particular population, the forb, the dominant forb, um, had a much lower protein content. Um, but again, we can see that they're more likely to tightly regulate, regulate their protein intake than their carbohydrate intake. And if we give them a choice, um, they end up um, feeding between these two um, in such a way that they get a, a, a particular blend of protein and carbohydrate. And what's really interesting about this, if you compare these two graphs, um, those orange dots overlap. So um, two different populations, but they regulate the same protein carbohydrate intake. Um, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit here. This is some work that I did as a PhD student um, looking at cholesterol use um, or sterile use in, in insects. Um, and here, uh, this is Schistocerca. This is work with Schistocerca americana. Um, and what I did in this experiment was to feed them mixtures of steriles with the idea that um, the, the sterile composition matters. The top black line indicates a diet that is 100% good sterile, which they can convert to cholesterol. The green line is a sterile that they don't convert to cholesterol. Um, and it used to be the thought was that as long as there's some um, amount of good sterile, it, it, that's all that matters, even if it's just a tiny amount. Um, but I, with, with my experiments, what I showed was that the ratio of these sterols actually did matter. Um, and that if there was too much of a bad sterile in a diet, um, the survival rate of these grasshoppers was low. Um, so this was a was a novel finding. Um, and basically, the mechanism is that insects don't practice selective uptake um, of sterols. Um, and, and so composition, the, the ratio of sterols in the diet can matter to them. I mentioned that I did a sabbatical in Germany. When I was in Germany, I did work and the basic idea was to try to integrate molecular approaches. This was kind of early days, and we and we did some work using um, microarrays, um, again using plants that are um, in the native range for Schistocerca. I had access to to a seed bank, 
And so we got seeds and we grew plants that were relevant for desert locusts um, in Africa. Um, and what we did here was to do experiments with diets. We did experiments with, um, with plants. Um, and for the plants, um, again, the plants were um, highest canvas muticus. This is a plant that contains a lot of alkaloids. Um, it's, a, it's a solanaceous plant. Um, the second plant was Shawia purpurea. This is a brassicaceous plant. It has a lot of glucosinolates. And then we had a mixed treatment diet. We looked at a number of life history traits, and then we did some gene expression. And again, this is with Schistocerca gregaria. Um, again, fundamentally, you know, we were interested in, in aspects or questions about what's the nutritional content. The two plants that we had um, had similar PC ratios, but the Shawia, um, which was the, the glucosinolate containing plant, uh, the mustard plant, um, had a higher nutrient concentration than, than muticus. Um, so again, we did experiments with, with individual plants and with mixes. Um, and a critical thing that we showed was that survival is best on the mixed diets. And so for insects like Schistocerca gregaria, having access to mixed diets um, can improve their, their survival and their performance. Um, we also saw that development was fastest when they were on mixed diets. Um, so again, benefits of mixed diets, higher survival, faster development. Um, we looked at different aspects of gene expression um, and specifically looked at uh, digestive enzymes. Here we have trypsin and chymotrypsin and beta, -gluca, beta glucosidases. The gray bars are the, the um, hyoscyamus plants, the yellow bars are the mixed plants, and the, pooper, the blue bars are the, the Shawia um, purpurea. And what you can see here is that the um, combinations of diets um, has impacts on um, gene expression, chymotrypsin, trypsin um, is related to protein metabolism. Beta glucosidases is related to um, carbohydrate metabolism. Um, and what you can see that the sort of one of the key takeaways with the chymotrypsin and trypsin is that the mixed plants have the highest um, protein metabolism. Um, and what's interesting with the beta glucosidase is that it's highest on the highest mechanic on the on the highest gyamus. Um, we think that this actually might be tied to um, metabolism of the um, toxins in these plants. Um, if you have high expression of, of enzymes related to um, metabolism of toxins, um, that's going to um, uh, negatively impact performance. And what you can see with the yellow bars is that um, mixing helps reduce the sort of cost of detoxification. And then hexamerins are storage proteins. Um, and here what we see, um, storage proteins are a way to, to hold on to amino acids that might be beneficial down the road. And you can see that the mixed plants, they have better hexamarin um, storage levels. Um, again, with, with um, detoxification enzymes, um, you can see that the um, mixed diets um, have, have high levels, and this is probably beneficial to them in terms of enhancing their, their survival. Um, and then this, this last group are ABC transporters. This is um, involved in, in sort of removal of, of, of toxins from systems. And you can see that it's really upregulated um, in the case of Pyoscanus muticus. So in summary here, um, what I wanted to sort of emphasize is that there's different approaches. We've used artificial diet approaches. We've used plant approaches. Um, and in some cases, you can even use um, things like Arabidopsis that have mutants ask questions about nutrition. We've done that with caterpillars. We have yet to do that with, with locusts. Um, I'm running a little bit long, um, but I'd, I'd like to sort of just hit on this last part, um, which, which ties into locust learning um, and, and ties to nutrition. Um, and uh, it, it, the focus on this last part of the talk is really on the ability of locusts um, to learn things about their food, particularly in a nutritional context and some of the broader implications for this. And so um, in the early 90s, uh, Steve Simpson um, showed really nicely that locusts can develop a learned hunger for protein. So if they're deprived of protein for a short period of time and then presented with an odor that previously has been associated with protein, um, they have a preference or a, 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 to go towards, towards odors that are associated with previously experiencing protein when they're deprived. So it's this learned hunger for protein. Um, I sort of asked um, some follow-up questions. How long is this learned hunger for protein retained? Um, and then is, is a learned hunger for protein retained following a molt? Um, and again, this was work done using Locusta. Um, 
The question is, how long can appetitive memory be retained in an insect? Um, the first is within a stadium. The second is across the stadium. Specifically, that is multi-effect learning. And what I just want to show you here is, is a really fun way to sort of ask this question and, and do these experiments. And so what you can see here is a is a cartoon figure of a chamber. Um, in the middle of the chamber, um, you can see a locust. You can see a water dish. To the right is an arm, and to the left is an arm. And at the end of those arms are diets that have been put down. In the right, there's a high protein food. On the left, there's a high carbohydrate food. Um, and then at the end of each of those arms is a little Eppendorf tube with some cotton. And then there's an odor that's been placed in there. Um, and then what the what the locust is able to do is to associate a particular odor with a high protein food or a high carbohydrate food. And then you can um, do experiments um, after they've gone through a series of training um, where you don't put the foods in the arms um, and then you deprive them of, of the nutrient that you're sort of focused on. So in this particular case, maybe protein. Um, they don't have a strong um, learned hunger for carbohydrates, but if you deprive them of protein and put, this in, put them into the arms, um, they have a tendency to enter the arms that have the smell associated with protein and they enter those arms and they go far down into those arms. So I asked some questions about how long can repetitive memory be retained within a stadium. And this is the training regime and, and the top three um, bars represent um, two days of training, three days of training or four days of training. Um, uh, the duration of a fourth instar locust um, is, is between sort of um, six to seven days. And so we did um, training in the first half of the instar. And then the bottom two, you can see there was two days of training with a one day gap. And then the last one was there was two days of training with a two day gap. So we're saying, does the length of that sort of gap matter? Um, how long do they hold on to that memory? Um, and so what we have here um, is, is the result just with um, retention of this memory within a stadium. Um, the white bars represent smell associated with protein. The dark bars uh, represent smells associated with carbohydrates. So if we protein deprive these insects, um, uh, whether they've been trained for two days, three days, or four days, the top panel says that um, they enter the arms associated with protein significantly more often than they enter the arms associated with carbohydrates, um, oftentimes three or four times for every entry into a carbohydrate arm. Um, and then the other critical thing is the, is the depth at which they go into these arms. Um, so what you can see on the bottom figure is that the smells associated with protein, they go deep into those arms. So they, the, the scores are one, two, three, or four. Four means it means they go all the way into the arm. Three means they go 75% um, into the arm. Two means they go 50%. One means they go 25%. So what you can see is they go much deeper. They enter the protein arms more often. And when they enter them, they go much deeper. Um, and it's the same whether they've been trained for two, three, or four days. But what happens if there's some gap between those learning? With a one-day gap, you can see um, at the top, that they um, enter the arms associated with protein so they can retain this memory for at least 24 hours. But after 48 hours, um, they're entering the arms sort of with an equal frequency. Um, the bottom bar uh, chart represents their um, entry depth. Um, and what you can see that the um, on 24 hours after learning um, or after 24 hours without training, um, they're still going deep into those arms. Um, and likewise, even 48 hours after um, with a 48 hour gap, when they do enter a protein arm, um, they're going much deeper into that than they are. So there's this, even after 48 hours, there's a, there's some indication that there's a partial memory, um, which is interesting because it, it, it sort of says that locusts um, probably have the ability to sort of remember information about the nutritional quality um, of foods in their environment, even without constant reinforcement. Um, the last thing I'm gonna end with um, is some experiments that I did um, focusing on learning using Schistocerca gregaria um, with the idea of locus as a model system for learning. This is something that I developed with a postdoc um, in a, a, a bird lab, um, but somebody had done some work with, with honeybees, um, and um, there's an undergraduate that was Martin Shapiro, and then uh, this work was initiated by um, a, a master's student from the Netherlands. And what we have here is, our, is this chamber that we created um, and this middle chamber is sort of a holding chamber. And then what you can see is that there's um, arms coming off the ends on both sides. We call this a double Y maze. Um, and in this particular figure, it shows um, arms that are wrapped in yellow cellophane and green cellophane. And what we're trying to do here is 
ask questions about the extent to which um, a locus can associate colors with a reward. Um, this is the arena that we used. Um, there was a computer underneath where we recorded the movements and behaviors. You can see that we can we we controlled access into these arms with with doors that we could raise with um, pulleys. Um, and then when we actually did experiments, um, we did this through a blind so that the locust couldn't see us. So we could do direct observations. Um, and the types of data we collect in these experiments, we, we asked um, choice data. So um, imagine um, on this figure, here's our double Y maze. They don't have access to all four. They have access to, to two at a time. So they, they, we would raise a, a, um, all the doors on the right. Um, and they could enter either the green or the yellow. And if you look at these figures, you can see at least in the green right now, there's um, four little green lines that's it's meant to indicate four pieces of wheat. In the yellow, there's one piece of wheat. And then we, we measured um, three different things, time to enter an arm, time to reach the food, and time to exit the arm. Uh, and what did we show? The first thing we showed is that locusts can learn colors um, and they have an innate bias for yellow. So this is just a circa gregaria. So when they're naive um, and they've never experienced it, they always went to the yellow arms over the green arms. But um, with some training and with experience, we showed that um, they would learn to associate green. If that's where the um, four pieces of wheat were, they would go into green arms um, first. Um, in the case of the yellow, um, we showed that they um, preferred the yellow, and once they learned, they always stayed in the yellow. Um, and if we combine these together, what we can see is that um, after nine trials, um, they actually were pretty good at associating a color with the size of a reward, in this particular case, the number of pieces of wheat. Um, what else did we do in these experiments, um, and, and sort of how do we summarize what we got out of these? Um, with gregaria, we showed that good choice performance um, is sensitive to associative learning, and usually within three to four trials, they, they could make um, the correct choice most of the time um, after three or four experiences. They could do this with absolute amounts, so it was four pieces of wheat versus one piece of wheat, or nutrient amounts. We did experiments with artificial diets where the total macronutrient concentration was 21% versus 7%. Um, and we show that they consistently pick the um, block of food that had the higher nutrient content, even though the size of the block of the food was the same. Um, we showed that the response latency to it was sensitive to approach time. So what that meant is that um, they were quick to sort of choose an arm, um, but we showed that um, that response uh, latency was not um, responsive to sort of the enter time or the exit time of those arms. Um, and then we also did experiments where we um, reversed the, the sort of association um, and we showed that when you um, tried to sort of unlearn or sort of see if locusts could unlearn previous experience, at least within within a day, um, they, they had a they were not very good at sort of reversal learning. Um, the last thing I want to end with um, is are some experiments um, that looked at sort of um, the nutritional state of an animal and how it sort of influences. And the fundamental question is if if, if decisions are based on fitness consequences, why do animals sometimes make poor choices? Um, and so this is some work that was done with this um, graduate student uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the bird lab. Um, and we um, investigated state-dependent learned valuation and, and, it's, and how that drives choice um, in this particular case in an invertebrate using gregaria. And the basic idea here, if you look at this, at this chart, um, is on the x-axis, you have the state of the animal at the time of learning. And so L means it's in a low nutritional state, H means it's in a high nutritional state. And then on the y-axis, um, there's the value, utility, or function of any given um, item or reward or food resource that they might have. And the basic idea here is that the um, perception of an, of, a, of an award or reward for an animal um, in this particular case, uh, a locust is dependent on its state. And so um, you can see here that the, the green arrows to the left um, are equal in their, in their length, which means that they actually, their absolute values are the same. Um, but the perception of those values um, are um, determined by the value of the, um, the, um, of the, 
reward or the resource um, based on its physiological state. So when it's at a low state, you can see that the slope um, is much higher, um, that orange slope compared to the blue slope. Um, uh, the blue slope um, is where the, the nutritional state of the animal is much higher. And so um, another way of sort of thinking about this, um, and again, if we take pieces of wheat, um, here we've got sort of the value utility function um, is an asymptotic curve, um, but we've got um, physiological state on the x-axis and there's the green um, bars represent wheat, um, a piece of wheat that's presented to the locus. And you can see those pieces of wheat are the same, but if you project them um, to the asymptotic function and then convert that to the value or utility function, you can see at a low physiological state, um, the value is gonna be much higher compared to a high physiological state. And so the question is, is does this actually translate um, to certain in, in their behavior? So how did we do this? Um, we trained insects over a period of five days. These are um, Schistocirca gregaria, um, gregarious morphs. Um, we collected newly molted ones, provided training over um, three days. Um, and this training consisted of, of um, different training sessions where we had a morning session and an afternoon session. And what you can see is, a, is a, this is a time course. Early in the morning, they got one big piece of wheat. Everybody started with a piece of wheat. They were not fed overnight. Um, and then at, at different parts of the day, um, we presented food to them um, and we changed their nutritional state. And so what you can see is that there are bigger chunks of wheat in the morning than the afternoon. Um, and what you can see also is that there are eight trials. And during these trials, um, this is when the odor was associated with, um, with that small piece of wheat. And so we had states where they were under um, a good nutritional state, where they, they had been having much more food. Um, and then in the afternoon, we would do a session where they um, didn't receive as much food. Um, and so their trials, when they experienced a particular odor, they were um, sort of in a more deprived state. Um, and then we reciprocated these two to sort of change the odors um, so it was a, a balanced design. And then on, on um, day five, we did a test um, and we, we tested them under two different states of reserves, either low or high. Um, and we used this, this um, double Y maze um, approach. Um, and here we had um, tested under option L, which was, um, which was lemon with yellow, or option H, which was peppermint um, that, um, uh, and yellow here, it, it's, sorry, the lemon should be green. Um, and we did six trials um, for these, um, for each individual insect, and we completed these in less than an hour. Um, and we measured the latencies. And um, these are the quick results. Um, the physiological state at the time of learning um, affected future choices. And so um, what the um, x-axis is, is it shows the um, test subjects that we used, and the y-axis um, shows the choices for option L. So option L, that's the odor that was um, associated with the piece of wheat when they were under a um, sort of uh, extreme physiological state, so when they were deprived. And so the question is, um, did they prefer the odor associated with that extreme state, or did they prefer the odor associated with the more um, uh, replete state? Um, and so when we tested under low reserves, we showed that they had a preference for the option associated with training when they were under low reserves. But even when we tested them under high reserves, they still preferred the option um, that they experienced under low reserves. Um, and when we view these together, the, the um, point here is that if feeding was random, um, those bars would um, overlap with the 50% mark. But what you can see is that they consistently chose the um, option associated with training when they are under low reserves. Um, so what does this sort of mean um, in a bigger picture and, and how can this help us understand um, suboptimal behavior? So this is the figure that I showed at the beginning. Um, even more so if we add another piece of wheat um, at this um, higher reserve state um, and we sort of, but we, we put this in the context of sort of the value of that given their um, internal state if we sort of transcribe that to this to this fitness function, um, what we can see is that the perceived um, a reward is still much greater um, under this low reserve. And, and sort of the equivalent to this 
um, as it relates to us, maybe is if you're driving down the highway and your um, your car is full of gas and you pass a gas station, um, you, you really don't think much of it. But if your um, gas tank is very empty and you drive by um, a gas station, um, you're going to sort of be more you know, inclined to sort of um, see the value in stopping than if you're on a full tank of gas. So um, interesting ways to sort of use locus broadly um, in terms of um, understanding both nutrition and foraging decisions. And with that, um, I'll end it. I'm sorry if it went a little bit long, but thanks for your attention. Hi, Spence. There are so many questions in the chat. Greg answered some of them. I think the one burning question that had from the Doris, I think you are the expert to answer. So can you go for that comment? So I can read it for you. Since sure. locusts can self-regulate protein carbohydrate content of the food, have you looked whether they can regulate amino acid profile of their food? So uh, nobody has looked at that yet. Um, the closest that we've come, we've done some experiments where we've used different protein sources, which have different amino acid profiles. Um, but that's a really good question, and maybe that's something that um, Chris might want to work on as part of his PhD. Okay, I think other questions, Greg, answer some of them. So I will share the question with you. If you have a time, you can answer if you want to add something more. So thank you very much for your time. I don't like to take more than that. So, so thank you for attending, everybody. Thank you very much. See you soon in next month. Okay. Thank you.